Welcome to episode 154 of the Access Noise Podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I speak to Simple Minds bass guitar legend Derek Forbes about his autobiography, A Very Simple Mind, on tour. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to Laurie Love from Alabama 3 about their new studio album, Cold War Classics, Volume 2. So check it out. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe on your favourite listening platform, give us a rating and leave a comment. Derek Forbes is known for his iconic bass riffs, which we recognise in most Simple Mind songs. Derek co-wrote many of the band's earliest classics. In this interview, Derek talks about how he nearly joined the Navy, the early days of Simple Minds, recording with David Bowie and Iggy Pop, getting sacked by Simple Minds, and lots, lots more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Derek Forbes. So, hi Derek, welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you. You're, you've written your autobiography, A Very Simple Mind, on tour. I've read it. Yeah. I really, really enjoyed it. It's very interesting. I laughed out loud at moments. You know, it's a it's a fantastic book. Yeah, well, that's that's good that you've enjoyed it. So, as I said to you before we started, that uh, I've not even read it yet because I don't know what they've left in and left out. So, is it? I was asked to write sixty thousand words, and I must have ended up with about one hundred eighty thousand or something like that. I just kept going, and I could have kept going and going and going because they only got to it was to nineteen eighty five. As where I was originally planning to stop. And uh, they said, oh, no, you'll need to tell us what happened after. You need to fill us in with that. So so it's a, it's a pricey of that. It's, it's not in-depth, as it were, when it gets to the end of the, the other years. But it's a good bit anyway. Good. It was a lot of stuff. <laughs> the pressure. The pressure's <laughs> off now. The pressure's <laughs> now doing this. You know what I mean? When and why did you decide, did you decide to write it? Well, I've always, since I was, I think I was nine, my grandfather gave me a, a typewriter and I used to write stories on it and, and I, d- I did that for years, just writing little stories and poems and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so I was always writing and then as I got older, I got diaries and I've started to fill them in, especially when I st- started playing music and signing up to uh, record companies. I, I kept a a diary of that, but a lot of it was left out. Sometimes it'd be left out, but I kind of joined the joined the dots, and it's a lot easier when you've got fans writing. about I was at this gig, and I go, "Oh, right, we were there, and we did this and that." And it, the book, as you as you know, you've read it. It's not about how did you play that and how did that song come about. No, that's not a lot of that in it. It's more about what we were doing on the way to gigs and after gigs, <laughs> all that traveling around the world. So I, I always wanted to write a book about uh, that you would pick up in a bookstore or whatever when you, when you were doing a long haul flight. And sometimes I wanted people to see people's shoulders get up and down laughing. You know what I mean? That's what I wanted. I wanted to you know, just take your mind off the flight. Because we used to do flights that were like 30, I think it was 36 hours. It took us once to get to Australia. I think that was the first time we went, and we got four hangovers on the on the flight over. So we were all steaming, <laughs> steaming on the plane, <laughs> and you weren't allowed out. You maybe you get out. I think it was Bombay before it was Mumbai. We were there, and we get out into the the actual concourse and the the airport. But it was just like a a bazaar, you know. It was just like lots of tent tents thing, and people selling things. So that was good, and. Uh, stopping in Hawaii for a, an hour or so as well and getting out and feeling the, the heat hitting you and, and just, it was magical, really magical. So we, I, I really loved flying. I loved going all over the world doing that. That was the best part of it. Not the best part, the best part was actually writing the songs and, and getting the albums out and then performing on stage. But but that was the, the other thing that, you know, that I loved about touring and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you about diaries because the book is very, very detailed. Was it an enjoyable experience writing the book and, and having to look back? Sometimes it, it could be a wee bit 
depressing because I'm not there, I'm not there anymore. You know what I mean? So that, I did feel a bit down when I was doing it. I was saying, this is quite difficult, this, because it brings out a lot of emotions and whatever. But funny, the funny stuff, I mean, I was writing it, but killing myself laughing at myself, what I was writing and whatever. So that was good. And as they say, it's a cathartic getting rid of all the, the baggage that you had before, because my wife is convinced I've still not recovered from that, which is probably true, do you know what I mean, from getting out of the band. And then back in, it was a different scenario. But you're known as a brilliant bass player, but you started out on the lead guitar. And one of the songs you say in the book you mastered was Over the Hills and Far Away by Led Zeppelin, which is one of yeah. my fav- favourite songs of theirs. What intrigued yeah. you to that band and, and to learn their music? Well, my cousin, I've got an older cousin, and he, he introduced Led Zeppelin to me. He must have been about 69 or 70, whatever. Let, let me hear Zeppelin. And I just loved him. I loved him. And then, in retrospect, I got into the Yardbirds as well. So there's some great, I mean, brilliant tracks, great songwriters. Uh, but I got into Zeppelin, and I saw Zeppelin early in Glasgow at Green's Playhouse. And I didn't think they were that good live when I seen them, but it was just them. It was, it was Zeppelin for me. That was that was good. they were gods even then. And then I saw them at uh, where was we were in London, the Ells Court, nineteen seventy five. Saw them there as well. And then with Simple Minds, I met up with Robert Plant, who said he was a fan of the the, the, band, the band's music, and I could see him when I was on stage. I'm looking up, and I'm saying, God, Robert Plant! I just couldn't believe it. So it was great meeting your heroes that way, but that was Zeppelin was big, and it was all Jimmy Page stuff that I loved. I loved the guitar playing, so I get into all that. But the first gig I ever done was I was playing the whole of Pile Driver by Status Quo. <laughs> That's what I get into there. So I can learn all their stuff uh, and a few other bands in between. But the music career very nearly never started because you nearly joined the Navy. Be, oh, be I, the- I know. Oh, but you decided was, against it because they wouldn't let you play guitar. <laughs> oh, I, I, I did went through the medical, the old, you know, hold, holding the holding your your arms and, and cough. And all that. I went through all that. I had the full medical. Did all the, all the questions you asked me? I'm fine. She's right. You'll be going to. I think it was Portsmouth. They said she'll be going to Portsmouth in September. This was probably about the June or July even. It was close to to when they said that no, it was me. I was I was through. And then he just said to me, the officer said, if you, do you have any hobbies? I says, well, I'm, I'm learning guitar because I'd just been playing guitar. I, I wasn't that adept at it at that point. And uh, I says, well, I'm learning guitar. And he, he says, oh, you'll have no time to do that in the Navy. Well, but we do have some of the finest brass bands. And I just went, keys up. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wrap. <laughs> no, no way am I doing that. I'm not playing guitar. I'm Definitely no playing trumpets. You know, I, I was right against it. I didn't. I, although I liked a lot of brass <laughs> type of music as well, because they get drummed into me at school. You know, the Purcell's uh, voluntary in D, trumpet voluntary in D. So that was that was. I think we, when we get married, we get that playing as we went down the, the aisle. My wife and I. But and I was like, no, no, I don't like saxophones and all that, and the smell of the reeds and all that. I was like, oh no, I'm no. I'm not going into the bad breath brigade. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, have you ever smelt one? <laughs> oh, no, yeah. no. <laughs> well, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> oh, so, no, I thought, no, I'm not doing that. No, that that really put me off. I was looking forward to going around the world, but but as they say, you can join the Navy, you see the sea, and what do you see, see the sea? So, you ended up seeing the world anyway. I did, I, yeah. You had your first chart success in the band The Subs with the double A sing- the double A side single Give Me Your Heart and Party Clothes. When when you had that hit, did you think, right, that's it, I've made it? No, I didn't think I'd made it at that point, but it was great to see that we'd actually made the dent somewhere. And it was quite pretty good Belgium. That was that was where it was. So, you know, that was that was an inspirational. But the band we went on to uh we well, we signed as you know, we signed Stiff Records and that record went out. That's when it was big enough uh, in Belgium. But after that, we got a lot of publicity out of that that time because we'd saved all these people in Scotland and the blizzards. We'd saved a lot of them out. 
you know, we we really really did. There was a bit of a part of a car. It was about the size of the palm of my hand, and it was just all we could see. Oh, but what's that there? And then ended up digging it and digging it out. And there was an old couple from uh, uh, Hull, not Hull, Rotherham, in Yorkshire, and they were in there and they'd written their will to their kids, and we saved them. And then I went out that night, same night I went out uh, where a friend of mine who was pretty famous in the Simple Minds uh, scene before before it was Simple Minds, I think with Johnny and Self Abusers, it was Puss, this guy was Billy Thompson, but his name was Puss, and he they called him the Acid Man, so he was the man who was selling them acid. <laughs> when they were Johnny <laughs> and the Self Abusers. <laughs> so <laughs> him and I went out with shovels, and it was a blizzard, just a whiteout, complete blizzard. And we dug out, uh, dug our way out a path and whatever, and, and we got to a big truck that was uh, a truck that had been over in the ferry over to where we were in Thornaway. So we'd come over in the, the boat, everybody was off running about with Bibles and all that, praying, thinking, hope this didn't think. Every, people crying and all that. That was just, we were all drunk anyway, so we just lay about. Go for, went for a sleep, but it was on it was frightening. But when we got there, that's what we had to do. We had to go out and see who was uh, stuck and whatever. And we got the, the driver and the cabin boy. Lucky wasn't his name wasn't Roger. So uh if you if you're into Captain Pugwash, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so well we got them the two of them back and, and there was it must have been about must have been about ten of us or something. In this house up up in the Loch Droma, place called Loch Droma. And they were there for two weeks, digging out sheep as well. You had to look for a little hole in the snow, and that's where they were breathing through. Right. And we get down and, and you had to sit with the sheep. We weren't we weren't we weren't doing anything there, <laughs> but you put the feet there, unless they were good looking, right enough. No, but you put the, the, the legs underneath your arms and you heat them up. And you yeah. heat them up and then they're, they're away fine. But they can last for a couple of weeks under under that. I mean, it was 18 foot drifts of snow. They must have been the ones we got, must have been about 12 foot down or something like that. But we got them out. Uh, that was it was an experience. But after that, the band, the drummer left for another band, Cuban Heels, who became one half. The Cuban Heels were a band. It was Johnny and his self abusers split into two bands. One was the Cuban Heels, the other one was Simple Minds. And then in 1978, the start, was it 70? Yeah, 78. I think just in January, just that hug my knee out of 77, get into 78. That's when Simple Minds started. And they played, they didn't play that many gigs before I was in, but you got Mike McNeil in, the keyboard player. So he was in for a while. I think he joined in the march and they got me in to stand in. With them because the bass player had just left Tony Donald, who's no longer with us. Tony's gone, uh, but he was the original bass player of Simple Minds, and uh, but he never did the records. He, he, he did some of the demos and stuff like that. But you know that's a shame. Tony's a good guy. I'm, I've lost track now what I'm talking about. So well, you were talking about joining Simple Minds. Um, you joined. You were obviously, as we mentioned, you were, you were a lead guitarist. Um, and they asked you to join as a bass player. In the book, you say um, your your Gibson Les Paul guitar was stolen from a rehearsal room in, in Glasgow, and after yeah. that, that's when you decided that you'd say yes to Simple Minds and bec- become the bassist. Yeah, I was just returning the, the favour because Brian McGee had played drums with my drummer from a subs had left, and Brian came in and played a, a gig with us at Strathclyde Uni, and. Uh, after that, they, they needed me to come and play. So I played with them for maybe about a month. And they were asking me when you join the band. I says, well, I want to get back to lead guitarist. Says, anyway, I've got a, an audition with uh, the Rosillos, <laughs> believe it or not. So I was learning their stuff because I liked the Rosillos. I thought it was a great, fun band. And uh, John Callis, the, the guitar player, he wanted me to be in the band, but Eugene and Faye, they they said no no no, I don't think I like my look, and so they got a right good looking guy called Simon <laughs> Templar. <laughs> I'm sure that was his real name, but he gave me the job, <laughs> and I didn't. So I came back, 
And within days, my, my Gibson Les Paul was stolen from a rehearsal room that I worked in, worked out of the subs, which is basically an office, and it was all bars and all that. So it was somebody, I, I, I've been told who it was, but do you know what? I'll thank him if it, it comes to it, because if, I, if he didn't do it, you, you wouldn't have the simple minds. It sounds like that, you know, all these bass you- lines in your face. What, what attracted you to Simple Minds nicely? What was your first impression of, of, of the band and the guys, Jim and Charlie? I thought they, they looked, Jim looked really weird. I thought he was great with his bowl haircut. And Charlie was a right good look wee guy and, and really amiable as well. Really nice. Uh, but Duncan Barnwell, I went to school with Duncan Barnwell. He was a guitar player. He was one of the guitar players. Him and Charlie were the, the two. And uh, that's he, he got me. I was working in Spain for five months in 77, and I'm, that's why I was playing bass. Uh, I was playing bass for, uh, for about maybe two and a half, three hours a night, and then the rest of the night I was on the guitar playing with my teeth and behind my head, not Hendrix, so I was doing <laughs> everything. And then they would get guitarists from other clubs to come in and have a duel, duel and banjos. <laughs> that time in the morning, half four in the morning. Started at ten at night till half four in the morning, seven nights a week, and we rehearse every day apart from a Sunday from two o'clock to six o'clock. That's that's that was the hours I did. Incredible for five months. So and that, the base, at the base, I was reading the dots, I you know the manuscript, and playing along with an old but old bazaar in Cairo, and she's a lassie for Lancashire, and I belong. There was all these really shit songs. Uh, as well, but uh, and then we'd be playing the kind of more popular stuff, which was then you would have Don't Stop by Fleetwood Mac had just come out, and we're playing just playing loads of anything that was current at that point. We would learn, and it would be a you know a different show every night. There was always a theme every night, and the guy I was playing, he was a genius at all that. He was doing magic tricks like throwing up an egg and went to a plate to land on a plate and the plate smashed because it was just a lump of lead. It yeah, was the shape of an egg. And, and they called me the, the, I can't remember what they called me. I was his glamorous assistant, Doris or something like that. <laughs> One night, it was just all different daft things. So it was really good fun, but it got me into playing the bass. And so that's why I got the job with the subs is bass because they wanted me, they said, look, we need a, Need a bass player? I says, well, I'm going to get back to guitar. He says, says, but we've got two guitar players, and one of them sounded like a tractor revving up in the background. I mean, he was awful, so he became the manager, and I did the bass anyway. And once we were signed in, I went right, okay, I'm going back to guitar, and it never happened. So I'm a frustrated guitar player, as it were. But I'm sorry, where I'm sitting here now, we're surrounded with guitars, absolutely surrounded them. I just keep buying them. You said your first gig with Simple Minds was at the Mars Bar, and 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 you say in the book that you used to kick in with the song "Act of Love." Now, this was nineteen seventy-eight, yeah. and that song yeah. was only officially released last year on the Direction of the Heart album. You know that's a bit mad. It is mad because they make it sound as if that was a a new song. We've got a new song for you. It's no new at all. It's the first song I played for them. So, <laughs> and I liked the song. It should have been on the first album. We never. I don't know why they never put that on the album. Yeah, it's that a great track. Great. Yeah, that's a good track. It was good. It was powerful, really powerful, and just a great riff. I mean, very easy to play, but but really powerful. The sound, Charlie's sound was great, and Duncan's sound as well, because they had the same amps. They had these little Calisbro Stingray amps, and it had distortion on it and whatever. So it gave them that kind of rough edge and the powerful kind of sound. And then uh, then they get stolen. Charlie's got stolen when we were playing in Manchester at the Apollo. Somebody's nicked it after the gig, and then we had to get a, try and get another one. But I, I don't know if he got one. I can't remember. But he used different amps after that. And you mentioned life in a day and, and act of love. You, you said should have been on that there. But w- when you recorded, you know the album did well, and you were on tour with magazine, and the album yeah. went further up the charts than, than magazine's second hand <laughs> daylight album. Yeah. yeah. And and you say in the book they were so jealous that they turned off your power power while you were on stage. They did. I Raf, the the tour manager, Raf, and uh, who was the other one? It was uh, Dave Formula. We were told for the two that pulled the plug on us. So, but that was a compliment. It was a kind of backhanded compliment. We were, <laughs> we were putting the fear in them that we were going down better, mm-hmm. and the chart position kind of proved that. So, 
that was at uh, Drury Lane, the Theatre Royal Drury, Drury Lane in London. That was it. It's hard to say that without a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and you talk about you, you played two gigs in one of my local haunts, the Ulster Hall in Belfast. Now, yeah, you said you said you said in the book that you played there because there was so much demand for tickets. You had to you had to play two gigs in the evening. Now, I I cannot remember any band playing two shows at the Ulster Hall in the same evening. I know. Do you know? I could remember it when I, when I read that as well. It was, you know, we, we, obviously we did. I just remember a flight back to Edinburgh. There was no toilet on it, and we did some night with a drink. <laughs> I'm sure there's no toilet <laughs> to be playing over the end. Luckily, it was only about twenty five minute flight or something. But... Yeah, I know. That's a great, great place to play. That as well. I mean, that hall. It's great to play in Ireland anyway. But Belfast was fantastic. Northern Ireland. Just saying, it was it. We were it was Radio One who were over there with us. They'd filmed it and whatever, and and broadcast it on the radio. What I laughed about in Soundcheck, you say you always played the Sash because always you're a red the hot sash. Glasgow Rangers fan. Now that that would have been interesting in the Soundcheck and the Ulster Hall in Belfast playing the Sash. It was down well there. Yeah. You think so? <laughs> Aye, yeah. we did it all over the world. I, I said to them, I said, "Why do it?" Because I'm a I'm a Rangers man anyway, so. Uh, I says, why do, why do you play the sash? He says, well, I, I said, does that mean I'm going to eat you play for off to Dublin in the green? And they went, no, it's just a good tune. We like, like the tune. I'm like, it's mental. <laughs> really mental. To be fair, you didn't really bother about that. You get, you, uh, simple minds are, you know, it's connected to Celtic. Then they've got the Celtic crest and They never bothered at all about any of that. They were into music. That was it. We were all into music. I mean, I would, I liked football. We all liked football, but but it was more, it was more relevant to the music. That was the, you know, you you weren't like scampering about to get see who scored against who at that point. But in the uh, game of football arranged with MTV, the only boots you could find to wear was a pair oh, of Adidas Celtic football boots. So that's karma nightmare. coming back. I know, oh, nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even wear them. It was the only one I could find. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Gorbals and the Diehards, that's what we called the team. And we played the uh, we played the Pretenders. This was a mile and a half high. We're talking about uh, Colorado. So you're way up there and you're running about and <laughs> breathless. And then we played Red Rocks after that when we were up there at that time. And Red Rocks, Mel Gainer had to get oxygen. So we, we changed his name to the Oxygen Monster. Because he had to come on during the gig and give him up. <laughs> he just killed over. Wow. What a time that was. But it was sure. good. The football thing was great with everybody playing. So, Don't you forget about me. The Simple Mind's most popular song, Still Now. Everyone knows the band was asked to record it by Keith Forsey, but you, you were re- reluctant to do it. But in your book, you say that Jim suggest, suggested that you and Neasley sing it. I, I never knew that. <laughs> no, but I was going to sing it. I was going to, because me, uh, it was Charlie and Mick and, and Mel and myself. We said, well, this is going to be huge. I said, well, what, what about me singing it? And I don't know if it was Jim. It said to get Danny say, maybe he did say it. I probably did. If I've written that in the book, then that's what it was. But I did get asked. I was the one that was going to sing it. And I said to Jim, Jim, this is going to be massive. This is a big film company. I mean, it's enormous. I can't remember who it was that put it out, but it was an enormous film company and they were giving away holidays and houses and, and boats and cars and everything to get this thing uh, to publicise it. We saw the film with all the Simpty code, you know, you get the Simpty code at the bottom and uh, we seen it and we went, this is going to be massive. Just without all oh, the horseshit, <laughs> it was just like, wow, this is incredible. So, that's why we did it. I said to Jim, do you, need to do it? Says, do you think so? You think that? I said, ah, of course, it, it's going to be massive. And it was number one. And that's when, when they, obviously, when I left the band, we were number one all over the world. And they've never done that since. So I've left at the very highest peak of success for the band. So, so that was a wee comfort for me when I wasn't there anymore. Tell me about the time you were recording in Rockfield and uh, and David Bowie and Iggy Pop were recording there and Jim asked you to go and ask Bowie to play saxophone on the track. Aye, that's right. That's right. Yeah, we were. I, I think I'd been into Mont. Uh, what's it called? Well, into the village there. Into the village there, Monmouth. 
Right, and I was in there buying some socks. I don't know what I was doing. And I came back and went into the studio and Jim, Jim was in there and he says, Dan, he called me Dan. He says, Dan, hey, Bowie's up there with, with Iggy. He says, you fancy going to ask Bowie to play some sax on a track? And I went, ah, you're all right. <laughs> so I was going to go out there and I said, should I put my stage gear on? He went, yeah, yeah, put that on. So he put it, I said, what about makeup? And I says, I, I, was, you know, I put, so I put the eye makeup on. I had the, the stage gear I would wear on stage and I walked up. And the door, is, I've gone towards the door and to the right hand was the, the right hand side was the control room. To the left hand side was the games room. And I seen there was some something going on, some people in that the games room. So I just opened the door, and as I opened the door, David Bowie was sitting cross-legged on one side of the table, tennis table, looking big smile. And then Iggy turned round and looked behind him, big smile again. I went, "Hi, I'm De- I'm Derek from Simple Minds. We're in the other studio." I said, and Bowie said, "Can you sing?" I went, "I said, well, I do backing vocals with the band. This is because well, he said because we're looking for a." We're putting a big chorus here for one of Eggy's songs. Would you mind coming up? And I says, I'll, I'll do that. And I went, OK, right, thanks very much. The two of us smile away. And I turned out to get to the door and I, I, I turned back and I went, should I get the singer? And Bowie went, yeah. <laughs> and that was it. I just went away. And then Jim and I, I said, Jim, come on, we'll get up. We're singing with Bowie. So the two years went up and uh, in the room. And then we had Glenn Matlock, Patty Paladin, Steve New, uh, Ivor Cra- Ivan Crowell from Patty Smith's band, James Williamson for the Stooges. He was he was producing the, the album, but he was in with the chorus as well with us. Uh, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, I can't remember. If it, I'm sure it was somebody else as well, but I can't remember. And uh, Bowie was beside me on my right hand side, so I'm we're singing. And he says right, and you can hear it on the record. There, he's going say ta, 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 and he's doing all this stuff. And then he says, what do we have in common? Play it safe. So what do you have in common? Play it safe. And I was just imitating him. He was right beside me, but he was dancing because it was a thin white duke at that time. And he's doing that with his hips and he's bumping me away from the mic. <laughs> he's bumping into me like that. So that was amazing. Absolutely amazing. So we done have... it. And then the next day, they got the, the rest of the guys in, like Charlie Mick and uh, Brian, and got them up to sing as well. So they were on it. Uh, and I sat with Iggy the next day in the studio and he was doing the song Dog Food. Your mom and dad sure made a mess. Your dog food. I think on that album, on the Soldier album. Well, it must have been on the Soldier album. Or maybe he didn't do it at all in that. But that was the song he was singing. He said, what do you think of that? What do you think of that? Derek, what do you think of that? And I'm like, that's great, Jim. On you go. <laughs> <laughs> it was just me, him and an engineer. Just sitting there for, for a couple of hours. And then John Leckie the, took over. You, you must have had to really pinch yourself. Oh, I, I, know, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, the guys have idolised for years. Iggy, especially Iggy through uh, school. You know, I, was, I knew all, all about Iggy then. And, uh, I mean, you get the musical, New Musical Express and the Record Mirror and Sounds and whatever it was. We're always in it. And... And I, I was a big fan. And you also mentioned about bumping into Paul McCartney in the studio, and you're, you were able to tell him about uh, your sister Elizabeth having all the early Beatles records. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, Charlie and I went up to oversee a remix we were having done. And uh, at that time, it was New Gold Dream. It must have been in 82, was it? It was 82. And, and HMV, uh, Piccadilly Circus, was it Piccadilly? And we had we were the HMV was there and these big enormous blow up photographs of me, Charlie, Jim, and Mick and uh, Mel. Well, no Mel, I don't remember. I don't think we had big ones of Mel. <laughs> I think about it, but it was just the four years. And we had the they were out there and it's right outside the studio where we were at Air Studios. Uh, and uh, we went up there and Charlie and I were in a in a room. We're going and we seen your man from uh, what are you called again. Jeff Linton, Jeff, somebody, Jeff, the guy, the guy, uh, oh, I'm not I'm saying orchestral manoeuvre in the dark, <laughs> but it's like uh, it's uh, electric light orchestra. Sorry about that. Jeff Lynn. A, a senior moment there. Jeff Lynn. So he was there and I seen him and I went, oh, and then we said, well, McCartney's in the next studio. And we went, what? 
Charlie now like that. And Charlie had a stookie on it. Well, it, you know, I'd broken his, he'd, he'd uh, cut his tendon, so he had a, a plaster cast on his arm. And there was a big groove on it, a big groove where it had been put on. And I had in my pocket, I had a Beatles pass, a copy from a guy called Tim Hudson, who was a writer that went out with the Beatles in 64, went you know, to America. So I had one of these, and it was signed by a guy called Tony Barrow, who was their press officer. But so I had it with me because the guy just came in us just recently. And then uh, Linda came in and says, Would you like to, to meet Paul? <laughs> and tell her, uh, Right, I need Paul away in. <laughs> and then I'm standing there and I'm shaking. And my camera says, What are you saying for us? Is because you're the reason I do this. And then I'm telling them about that. But my sister said, That's what I was getting. And my mother was a nurse at the Glasgow Odeon. For the Beatles, when the Beatles were there as well, so I'd got it through my, you know, it was in my DNA by that time, the Beatles. Mm. So we, I, I think it was, was it Tug of War. Was it? I can't remember if that's the name of the album, but it was an album. Tug of War was on it anyway, and he was there. McCartney was in the studio. We was standing there with uh, his brother Mike McCartney, Mike McGear as he called himself, and uh, George Martin, Linda, Stella, Mary. And young James must have been there as well, and Linda McCartney and Heather McCartney, Linda's daughter, not the other one, no. So they were all there. It was just like, that's just unreal. And I mean, I, I did six and a half months in the, the Abbey Road, but this wasn't the Abbey Road, this was there, the Air Studios. Lots of great records come out of there as well. Yeah. So we saw them, saw, them, saw them playing. So at the end of it, I said, Paul, could you sign this? And I showed him the, the pass I had. So he went, oh, Tony Barrow, right, right, there you go. And he wrote, all the best to a very simple mind. And that's why I call the book To a Very Simple Mind, because Paul McCartney said that. Right. Wrote it. But then I think for me, all the best to a very simple mind. Uh, and then Charlie had the, the plaster cast, and he wrote, uh, I don't whatever he wrote to Charlie, but he signed the name Paul McCartney. Oh, Paul McCartney in the groove. He's talking about in the groove of the, uh, the caster, the caster, the plaster cast. So it was, he's pretty witty that way. <laughs> I think when you get your autograph, you always get a wee something else. It's not just the the name. Yeah. But I was, I was like, I just couldn't believe it. Meet McCartney. You got a call from the Simple Minds office. You were asked to come down and see them, and the, and the band's manager told you you were sacked um, because. You disappeared from no, the band. No, I told him that I was sacked. I walked in and says, what is it? I'm a sacked. <laughs> That's what happened. And he went, yeah, and usually it would take them two or three hours to get to that point. So I just says, what is it? I'm a sacked. I, no, you're right. But so, you, you, must have, you must have been devastated because you you're, you were with the band during the rise, the mainstream success, and their first six albums. You wrote and co-wrote many of the band's earliest classics. So how yeah. did you feel at that time? Did you think it was justified? Well, the thing is, I, was, I, I had a girlfriend at that time, and, and Jim didn't like the fact that I was, you know, getting in the papers all the, a lot of the time. And we had a, a, a fallout and we ended up in the papers. And But we were back together the next day. You know what I mean? That's, and that's the whole thing. So, oh, no, we're just about to go and do a huge tour. We're just about to go, you know, meteoric rise of the of the band kind of thing was on in the horizon. And because of that, they, they didn't like... See, I had my Yoko Ono moment where I took her everywhere, I took her all around the world. So I, I was kind of... kind of parted for the band, as it were. But it was, we weren't as close. So we always had a laugh together. But the thing is, I had my girlfriend with me. It was a, and to be fair, it was a bad move in my part. My part so I would advise people, don't do, don't do that. Just go on your work with your, with your mates and go on drag other people along because it, it really pissed everybody off. So but Charlie and Mick were crying in the in the office. They were with me and Paul Kerr was with me as well. And they think that no no don't want to do this, but he never it was Jim that wanted to do it. But I think there was uh, more to it than that. Everybody else was there apart from Jim? No, Jim did it from the phone in London. He was in London. Yeah. And I tried to get hold of Mel. But they must have told Mel it was going to happen. He was working with Elton John at the time. And I couldn't get Mel. And I thought, that's strange, not being able to speak to Mel. 
But he tried to get me back a, bit, a couple of years later. No, no, maybe just over, maybe about three years. No, they, they were trying forever. Charlie was always trying to get me back, always. But I was away with propaganda as well. So I had joined propaganda a couple of months after. And so I was seven years with them. But I'd been asked to go back to the band. And they'd, they were saying that you can write, you'd be the writer, you do it, the whole thing. And I went, and then I went up to here. Which album was it? it was the Once Upon a Time, Street Fighting Years. Street Fighting the one with Belfast Child on it. Yeah, Street Fighting Years, yeah. And I heard it and I went, nah, that's no, that's not for me. It's not for me. Just didn't, didn't, you know, it wasn't Simple Minds anymore because Once Upon a Time I had been writing on anyway. I was there at that time. But I never get never get acknowledged. And then I was on the the Live in the City of Light album as well. I had to come in to make it sound more like Simple Minds because my big pal John Giblin is I mean he was an incredible bass player John. He's gone as well, which is unbelievable. But he was incredible. He came to see me and says if you don't want me to take this job, I'll then I'll not take it. So it's up to you. It's not John if anybody's gonna take it rather it was you. So so he did. But that's uh, that's the way it, the cookie crumbles. But I was back again anyway, as you know. The Neapolis album, nineteen ninety-eight. So we like to call it Naples. Naples. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very underrated album. I quite enjoyed that album. You know, War Babies. Do you know what? Some of it was some of it was great, but they never let me. Well, they never let me do it because I said, look, if I if I play a I'll be not on this and do it. I was, that's right. And Jim went, oh, no, 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 no. We don't do it that way anymore. I says, well, how do you do it? He says, well, it's just a, a lot of session. You do it a lot of session. But they were paying me a wage every week for being there. So I was getting paid for two or three years, four years, whatever it was, I was back man. But I couldn't help myself. I was with Pete Walsh as well. So Pete was there. Me, Pete and Charlie were there. And uh, I couldn't help, you know, putting stuff on. It was really working out stuff with drums and whatever. and uh, But they brought it all at the mix. They just pulled it in because it was sounding too much like bass heavy again, you know, bass in your face. So I thought I'd love to hear it mixed the way it should be mixed because yeah, there were some you... great songs on it. Yeah. But Charlie did litter ball and he got the bass and he strummed it. He just was strumming the bass. I'm going... <laughs> But then, so when I when I actually got it for doing live, playing live, I, I really pumped it up. So it was really punky and hard and aggressive, whereas it was just a strong bass. It was like, you know, I just, just, I think uh, nothing like what I would do anyway, nothing like a bass player would do. I, I, I formed a wee painting company. I was a painter and decorator, believe it or not, all through this. A couple of cunts. A couple of cunts, a couple of cunts, yeah. <laughs> So that was great. It was people. That's one where the shoulders go up. Somebody reading it. We used to put posters up in the window, and we are not cowboys. And we'd come back, we'd get the paint all over our face like that. We are not cowboys. <laughs> We're like Native Americans standing there, looking. and you see people reading it, and then they read something. This is tea drinking champions of nineteen seventy three or something like that. They would say. Mrs. T E from rather Huddersfield. I've never been so disappointed in my life. <laughs> <laughs> job these guys left. No, it was just uh, like these things you got, and it was all different people. Mrs. T, Mr. Mr. P, and all that. So we used to do that, and then you just see people coming up and reading, oh, oh, and then it's like ah, they're just laughing. You know, that was great fun. The guy, the guy I worked with was an absolute nutcase. We used to write songs over. We do overnight stuff. We we go in and do coffee shops, and it had to be done for the morning up the next day for people coming in. That was great. That was great fun. Good laugh. I, but, I nearly uh, fell off mature when I read that. That's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's some some people say. What are you going to do about the about the room? I said, you going to? I said, I've just got a couple of cuts in to paint it. You know what I mean? It's just <laughs> something you say up here. Probably the same in Ireland, I would think as well. Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland. Yeah, there was one thing um, actually that I haven't heard in, in, in years. When you're you're having your piece, oh my piece, your lunch. I, I would say lunch that a piece, aye, a piece, aye. 
teasing your piece, eh? we guy used yeah. to say that to me all the time. Who, what have you got? I was deaf, and you go, Who you got in your piece? Jeez, are you a fucking moose? He used to <laughs> shout that at me every day. It's like, uh, I haven't fun. heard that in ages. Aye. <laughs> And and your auntie June, who was engaged to a famous Glasgow banjo player. That's right. Aye, aye. Oh, is that that stayed in then? See, do you know what? Yeah. I've got boxes in here. I, I took in about five, no, two hundred and seventy books here. I've got. I've not even opened it. Yeah, I've not even looked because I'm not going to do it until my wife Wendy she comes back in. I look and she's there. And the banjo player <laughs> turned out to be Billy Connolly. Aye, aye. Slept in my grandmother's bed with my uncle John. The two of them, they slept with a piss that was in stagnate, and they had to go and get some hash for Iris, who was Billy's wife uh, at the time. And they, they were just, they'd just been out for that, and they'd been for stagnate, got all pissed up, because Uncle John obviously married June, Billy's ex. Uh, no, but they stayed pals forever. They were, he was always coming up to the house. I met him a, a few times, Billy. What are your five favourite Simple Mind songs you've worked on? Five favourite ones. Uh, this Fear of Gods. The American was a strange one. When I wrote that, I was like wondering whether it was it was good good enough. Uh, but it's really powerful and it's, it's, and it's strange. And I had John Leckie up with me and, and Brian McGee up at Mick's house in, in Barra or Battersea. And uh, John had never seen that because that was after after him. She did the first three albums, and when he seen me going, you know, playing with the plectrum and then and playing, you know, pop and, and whatever, you know, he couldn't believe it. So that was one of my favourite ones to play as well. Because I mean, that's one that the minds like. They always talk about the Bonanza version. I'm just going, but it just builds up. Jim's naming all these American towns and stuff. So that's one of the most popular ones. But that, uh, this fear of God's sweat and bullet for the baseline, and I like uh, King is White as well. Mm-hmm. King is White and in the crowd, I like that for it. And somebody up there likes you. So there's quite a few fretless ones in there. Yeah, because that again, that was being a lead guitar player, a board lead guitar player. So I had to get different things to do. So it was easy to express myself when I. A fretless bass because you can. There's more notes than a fret, fretless bass because you just move them all over the place. Yeah, uh, I think. Well, I travel's great as well, isn't it? Yeah. There's too many. I can't. I can't even limit it to five. There's too many. It's from the yeah, early days, from the first album, pleasantly disturbed. I love that. It's an amazing track. Aye, that was just Jim and Charlie that wrote that. That was nothing to do with me. But I, I did all the stuff, all the orchestration stuff, as me. It's the 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 orchestra would play the. All the bass parts I was doing, all that kind of stuff. There was loads of that. I did all that in the bass because because we never had strings there doing that. What uh, what Simple Minds album did you enjoy working on the most? Uh, now, do you know a lot of them was getting hard to separate John anything with John Lecky because John was genius, and then old Cabbage Head Steve Hillage. That was amazing. I mean, he had a heart scare during that as well. I had to go to the hospital. He thought he was having a heart attack and they took him to the hospital. Because that was too... Because he was a musician. Theme for Great Cities, that's another one, a good good baseline. When he just went, just kept taking it. Take, another take, another take. And it just got faster and faster. For me, it was just all over the place, which was great. Uh, but he was, you know, he was really, really good as well. I think who else? Well, Lily, right? That was that was say uh, I was now sounding a bit more U two than more than Simple Minds or U three. U three, I called us U three, didn't they? I. <laughs> uh, yeah, the both the both Simple Minds and U two still get compared today. Yeah, in the sound, which is mad because well, I, I think remember it's... the first the first time we met was at Torhout and Werther, and we did the festival. And one night, you two went on first or last before Peter Gabriel, because Peter, Peter was doing the, he was headlining them. So you two went on before Peter, and then the next night we went on before Peter, and so you two were on before us. 
So we watched them, they watched us, and then suddenly you two, they kind of calmed it down a wee bit and started to be more static at bits. And whereas we started to jump about, so we were taking something for them, they were taking something for us. It was very obvious to us. You know, they've seen us because we used to just stand, I just dance in the spot or just I had this move that I'd just do. You know, people couldn't, drummers couldn't believe it. How, how do you stay in time when you're doing all that? Because I'm, I don't know, I, I would do moves. I'd be rocking about doing this to, to a groove that was going on that I'd absolutely no. It just looked like I was listening to something else. I probably was. <laughs> Very <laughs> strange. You- if if you could go back and relive one musical moment from your career, what would it be? One musical moment? Uh, well, I would like not to trip on stage when uh, Olivia Newton-John's looking at me. That would, that would help. <laughs> and my, because I went on stage and I went, Olivia Newton-John tripped over the cables for the lights and we had the smoke and I just came through the smoke like that and I stood the whole time going, you plonker, you absolute toss. I was standing still and just didn't move at all. I was just like, no, no, and I could see us. I was like, oh, that was embarrassing. But uh, yeah. trying to be I'm all cool. But then, but then you, also, you also said you kept, she was standing outside your dressing room while you were having a. For an hour, we were having a post mortem. Yeah. So we never met, met her. I'd have been chatting away to her like mad, knowing me. So <laughs> I'm trying to think on stage for something. Well, it'd be good to get to a toilet before I went on that one in the, in Belgium in Liège. That would have been a good moment. If, if I could relive that moment, I would have went to the toilet before when I left the restaurant. <laughs> yeah, you, you handed the bass guitar to Jim, didn't you? And then you just pulled uh, it. He's swinging it around his head going like, shitey, shitey. <laughs> but it was all right. I was, I was fine. I mean, I was, I was the only one who had uh, a superb a lady friend after that that night and I couldn't believe it just like but of course I was cleaned up by that time Simple Minds are still around touring making new music if, if the call came again from Jim and Charlie to do something would you take them up on it? I think it would only be polite to do I, I would I would do it with, with as long as Mick was there and Brian I don't think I don't think it should go I love Melty Bits don't get me wrong Mel is great as a powerhouse, but all that early stuff with Simple Minds, Brian had a hell of a lot to do with it. If he didn't start doing no premonition and all that and start playing all these beats and boys from Brazil or, or Brian was great for all that. Brian was just steady, powerful, steady, musical. He was very musical. Mel, Mel's a genius. Mel does things that you, you wouldn't believe, but sometime in a song... It's not really about that. Shouldn't he? That shouldn't really matter. But Brian was just like, let me do that. He'd get a groove and that would be it right through. And uh, that was perfect for the band. Then. That's when we were most creative. Sons and Fascination. You know, New Gold Dream as well. That was that was all written by Mick, myself, Charlie and Jim. It was only four years that wrote that. And that was incredible. And great, great work with Pete Walsh. Produced that. I mean, it really is a standout album. Yeah, it's great. Have you have you heard the latest release, the, the new live version of it? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't thank you for it, probably. I can't imagine it being anywhere near the original. That yeah, was a great Mike. moment. Doing, doing that, that musical moment was... I had Mike Ogletree, the drummer on one side, Mel Gaynor facing each other, two drum kits, me in the middle. And then there was like percussion going on and me playing the bass. And that was just, that was a moment. That was actually standing there, me playing the bass, keeping them right. This is the, the arrangement. And the two of them looking at each other, boom, 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 boom. Just a cacophony proper to use a simple mind. <laughs> what? <laughs> real to real cacophony. But it was, really was. It was just magical. Incredible. Yeah, it's, the it's, kick it's, inside of me, that that track, the kick inside of me, if you know that one, where I'm, I'm just battering them. Mm-hmm. And my thumb just exploded, you know, I kept going. I made Paul McGuinness sitting there and he just went, the once and future king, about me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Aye. So that was that was an honour there, getting that for that man. He was brilliant. But at the end of the book, you say, I must say to all my loyal fans who who still follow the band, you will be in for a special treat quite soon. 
What does that mean? I it'll be the Mick and Brian and myself getting something. This this documentary will come out, and that's telling stories as well between the threes. It's great when there's there's more than one telling a story because they'll come in, it comes in and out, and they'll remind me of something, and it's all prompts. It prompts you, and the three is playing. And you want to hear it, it's just simple minds. It just the three is playing together. It's just simple minds. It's it can't be anything else. It just sounds like I mean we'd blow them out of the water, to be honest with you. Aye. We would definitely blow them out of the water. Just just playing together. Okay, because I read into that though, you probably would be joining back up with the band again. Although there's about twenty in the band now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know, I I know. I've got this ex ex simple ex simple minds site or whatever, and you're thinking who who <laughs> you know they've not done it, and it's and they're using different writers as well. They could have asked me to write along with Mick and even Brian. We could have written some stuff for them for the years and just done it. We're no there. They've got their wish there away doing their, their stuff, and we could have been writing for them. Madness. Yeah. Madness. That would be amazing if you did doing it. Aye. Well, we'll see what happens. Well, no, I'm not dead yet. I'm no, no far away from it, but I'm not dead yet. <laughs> well, Derek, your book signing tour starts on the 9th of November at Goldsboro Books in London. Now, that will be yeah. a very different kind of tour for you. So how much are you looking forward to that? Um, uh, it's a good laxative, as we, as we say. So if they play some stuff, so uh, as well, and some of them, some of them, but Goldsboro is just a signing thing. And then I go to Rough Trade and I do I do a bit of uh, interview or, or, or answer questions, whatever, and then, and then I sign in, and then I play a wee bit. So I don't know what I'm going to play. So I'm practising a wee bit just now. I, don't, it's, I shouldn't be doing that. I don't think I should be doing that. It's just that's what they've got me doing. Because if I'm playing acoustic guitar, it's not playing bass. You know yeah. what I mean? So, but I'm going to take a bass with me as well so I can say things like Waterfront, how it was that came about. Because everybody thinks Waterfront's only one note. But it's not. You know, the whole the whole fretless thing, that I mean, the whole melody was all me. That's what I gave them. I think it was the day before we went to Phoenix Park to play with you 2 and your girlfriend's flat, wasn't it? You, you, you initially wrote that. Aye, aye. I was in the bedroom. I just I had a an amp that had a, a sampler on it, but it was only about a quarter, a second or something. It was like a, a quarter of a second or one point, whatever it was. It wasn't that much anyway. And uh, I just went do do, and and as I pressed it, it came back do 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 do, and then I went do 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 and then all the slapping bits in it and uh, bum, bum, ding, and all the harmonics and stuff. So so that was it. And then Jim did his bit with uh, lyrics and all that. He said he'd, he'd written lyrics about, I thought it was about Andy Stewart, to be honest with you. It was about Scottish come in, come out of the rain, winking and all that, all that stuff, you know. <laughs> That's me, he's ruined it. No, but. Oh, it's just brilliant. That's that's my most greatest go dates, and just going do 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 whatever you want. Do 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 do. No, it could be anything like that, but it's just yeah, it was just the way we the, the treatment we gave it that, that made it what it is. And yeah, and then you went on, and as you say, we're at the side next day in Phoenix Park supporting you too. It was the first time people heard it. Yeah, I'd like to hear that because that must have been that must have been metal. It must have been jazz. There's bound to be bootlegs around. No, there will be, wasn't there? Aye. And as we were playing, a plane, a wee plane goes over and it's got a uh, big country who I joined later on. You know I mean? I was with them for about four years as well. So they were yeah. flying over. They says, we could see you on the plane. Oh, Bruce is telling me that. So. But th- Derek, that's me done. Um, is there anything really? you'd like to mention before we wrap up? Anything else coming up in the immediate future? Any any musical projects? After well, I've got, a, I've, I've got a tour with Spear of Destiny. It starts on the 3rd, 3rd of December in Nottingham. So I basically, I'm, I'm special guest with 
Kurt Brandon, who's one of my best mates. So and I played with Spear as well. I played with Spear for, for years. Uh, so that starts on the 13th, no, the 13th, the 3rd of December, and it goes on till the 16th of December. And we're playing all over. We're playing London, we're playing Nottingham, we're playing York, we're playing Glasgow, Ed, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Newcastle upon Tyne, Newcastle under line, Bedford, uh, I'm trying to think where else, Manchester, Liverpool. So we're all over the place with that. Yeah. And that's December. So the start of December up to a week before Christmas. Well, Derek, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, as I said, <laughs> yeah. a very simple mind on tour is a very enjoyable read. It's very interesting and laugh out loud funny. Uh, and, and I wish you all the best with it. Thanks very much. Cheers, Matt.